Hi, this is Dennis Gage, and this episode of My Classic Car I'm really crazy about because we're special convention guests of the International Mercury Owners Association here in Northbrook, Illinois. The theme and the name of this year's event is Crazy About Mercury's 97. Hey, and Mercury! Mercury, I love <laughs> and you! Believe me, there are some people here who are crazy about Mercury's. Now, Jerry, you're the president of the International Mercury Owners Association, but you're also actually the founder, aren't you? Right. Six years ago, with after I bought my first 59 Mercury station wagon, I couldn't find parts. I tried to find a national club and couldn't find one, so here we are, 800 members strong. Well, now, did you find kind of the same sentiment among other Merc owners? They were just, you know, crying for a place yeah. to, to go? I thought I was by myself, but I found that everyone had the same sentiments as I do. So here we are, got regions, but started in about six areas of the country. and. 800 members, but how many cars at today's show? 95. And, and every, from all over? Yes, and it's been growing every year. Jerry, a 57 Turnpike Cruiser. When I saw this thing, all I could say was, wow. <laughs> Personification of the 50s. It is the 50s in motion. And this is also a very special Turnpike Cruiser because under the hood lives... A um, 335 horsepower engine. It's 368 cubic inch. It was a dual carb uh, engine that was developed by Bill Stropey, who was very famous in the racing annals back in the 50s. And then these things are wild. I, I thought oh, that was a radio antenna. Well, this is the, the flow through ventilation system that the Turnpike Cruiser was very famous for and it would, the air would come in through here and, and exit on the inside of the car at, right at this point and then the rear window is electrically operated, goes up and down and the air would flow right out the back of and, the car. And right across this stunning uh, 50s stunning interior. Seat. Yeah, yeah. And what a sleek look, just all the way back. These skirts, I love these. Well, that's the Turnpike Cruiser uh, skirt and that's what, what's really made uh, many of the hot rods uh, of the 50s uh, famous were the cruiser skirts. And the dual deck antennas. And the Continental kit, the all, Continental all kit. 50s look. Even this little medallion in the back here lights up at night. It just sort of adds a little bit to the glitter and the glitz of the car. Now, Rich, this is an example of some serious Mercury muscle. What's yeah. the history on this? Yes, it is. This was an original car that the factory put together to go drag racing with. The car was sent to Dearborn Tube Steel and Holman and & Moody. It was prepared strictly as a drag race car. In 1967? In 1960, actually, 1966. It is a very early 67 automobile. And under the hood lives? A 427 single four barrel monster. Fiberglass hood. Fiberglass hood. So it's hood. kind of a lightweight? or it's... Yes, it is. It's a semi-lightweight. The car weighs 2,980 pounds. So Eldon, this is where it all began. This is where it all began, 1939. Uh... Well, the Mercury. This was the first Merc then? First Mercury uh, for the uh, Ford Motor Company, yes. And yes. they felt they needed a, an intermediate or? Intermediate between the Lincoln Zephyr and the, uh, and the Ford. Now what would this car have gone for back in 1939? A little over $900. Uh -huh. But you can't buy a fender for that now. <laughs> I bet you can't. <laughs> well this is where it all began and, and quite a piece of history. Thanks for sharing it with us, Eldon. Thank you. Welcome back to My Classic Car. The story of the development of Ford's Mustang is a unique mixture of passion, ambition, marketing, and good old-fashioned ingenuity. It's also the story of a car that was amazingly popular in its time and has remained so for almost 35 years. Fact is, you probably owned one or know somebody who did. There is a different story behind every car that is considered a classic. Some classics are born from the efforts of one dominant individual. Some seem to be the result of a fortunate chain of events. And some come from a small group of people working incredibly hard who know they have the right idea at the right time. This is the stuff of legends. And this is the story behind the Ford Mustang. A story that begins in the early 1960s. I think the uh, best way to understand the origin of the Mustang program is to go back to that period of time. And there was an aura around the Ford division of the Ford Motor Company of youth. You had the new president, John F. Kennedy, you know, youngest president any of us had ever seen. Uh, we had Lee Iacocca, the youngest VP of Ford. And you had another phenomenon. You had uh, a lot of market research showing up that said that there's going to be an enormous youth movement you know, with the baby boomers coming out of World War II. As you looked at that 
uh, there was a natural, why don't we make youth product that came out of this thing. The effort to create this youthful product began during the tenure of Robert S. McNamara, general manager of Ford Division in the late 50s. But McNamara would leave Ford in 1961 to become Kennedy Secretary of Defense, and it would be up to his successor, Lee Iacocca, to work with a few other key individuals at Ford to bring the idea into production. We knew that we lacked something exciting in the Ford dealerships because we were running on the cars that McNamara had produced, and it's pretty hard to generate a lot of excitement with a Falcon. So we had to do something. The problems which Iacocca, Fry, and Spurlick initially faced included history itself. The losses the company suffered from the poor sales of the Etzel were still in the minds of upper management, including the company president, Henry Ford II. There were just a handful of people working on this development. Even once we finally hit the original styling proposal, you know, there probably weren't 25 people in the company working on the program. Prior to the original production Mustang, the mid-engine two-seat Mustang One vehicle was developed by Ford to recruit engineering talent from colleges around the country. But behind the scenes, the car which would go into production was evolving in a different way. Lee Iacocca was impressed by the public reaction to the Mustang One, but he knew that the market for two-seater sports cars was pretty limited. But he did believe that there was a market for a, a four-seater car that could recapture some of the spirit of the original two-seater Thunderbird. Hal Spurlick came up with the idea that we better see if we can make the car out of the Falcon parts. Now, it wasn't going to look like a Falcon, but the heavy tooling stuff, the engine, the transmission, the drive line, the suspension, turned out the instrument panel actually came out of the Falcon to save all that money. And to this day, most people don't realize that the Mustang is a Falcon, reskinned. We were having trouble getting a final styling model that, that, that we liked. We're going for uh, roadster proportions, you know, long front, short rear, a lot of stance, but still with a good you know, interior space. So what we did, we set up a competition with seven teams of stylists who were each gonna do a different styling theme off that same basic package. The one that won was the one that Joe Orris ran which interestingly was called Cougar. It was gorgeous. And uh, it just fit the, the vision we had for that car perfectly. By arguing cost savings from using the Falcon as a derivative model, and armed with a magnificent Oros design, the team was able to get approval from upper management to proceed. I ran into Henry Ford that day. And Henry Ford came up to me and says, I'm tired of your damn Mustang. I'm going to prove I'm tired of hearing about it. I'm going to approve it this afternoon. You know, the day the thing was approved, you know, by the company, Henry Ford approved the program. Uh, I felt, you know, fantastically, but I also felt a huge burden. I remember walking out of the meeting and I cook and says, it's approved. I want to introduce it to the World's Fair. I said, when's that? He said, April 1964. I said, that's 18 months from now. We'd never done a car in 18 months in our lives, more like 36 to 40 months. He says, I don't care. I want to introduce it to the World's Fair. As part of the team's proposal, they estimated that roughly 84,000 units would need to be sold in the first year of production in order for Ford to break even. Yet there was a sense among the group that they were sitting on something special. So Iacocca took steps to make sure that Ford would be able to meet demand if the car's appeal took off. We started out to get the car tooled and in production in one assembly plant, which is Dearborn, and we got $40 million is nothing. Peanuts. Iacocca said this is a hit, so let's get. He went and sold the company on a second assembly plant, which turned out to be San Jose, California, to feed the West Coast. The 1964 World's Fair came, and so did the introduction of the Mustang. The team had met its production deadline, and dealers couldn't keep them in stock. When we had the styling that became the final styling for the car, when we had numbers that showed us we could price it at an attractive price, I was convinced at that point this car would be very successful. Nobody, including God himself, knew this car would reach those levels of volumes. It will sell over 400,000 cars in the first year. We made more money on that car. The average price with all the options on it was pushing three grand. Unbelievably profitable. The success of the Mustang was the result of marketing as well as design and low production costs. Iacocca employed a number of new techniques hyping the car's appeal. 
he convinced the owner of Tiffany's to create an award just for Mustang. Through Fry, he provided 50 of the top automotive riders in the country with a prototype to drive before the car's introduction. And it was one of the first designs directly marketed to women. It was probably the best marketing program I've ever seen. In fact, if you think about the original ad, it was a gorgeous, you know, picture and the words just said, you know, the new Mustang, you know, 2368. And that was all you had to say. I was a victim of the uh, marketing campaign and the advertising campaign that they, uh, that they had. They started running TV commercials with horses running across the, the screen, you know, coming April 17th, the unexpected. I think the Mustang came along at a, at a perfect time and it invented a market. The so-called pony cars are in fact named after the Mustang. As a testament to the popularity of that original car, the title Mustang has remained as a nameplate for over 30 years. The fact that it has attained the status of legend is also a testament to the vision and timing of that original group of people. There's very little accomplished by one man sitting at his desk having brilliant ideas. Good ideas generally come out of an interaction among people, and it was that way with the Mustang. Mercury owners are crazy about my classic car!